Kitco News special coverage of the PDAC convention is brought to you by Gold Mining and Uranium Energy Corp. Welcome back to PDAC 2022 here in Toronto. There are over 30,000 people here. It's the biggest mining convention on earth. But my next guest is interested in mining prospects in space and on the moon. I'm pleased to welcome Daniel Sachs. Daniel is the CEO of the Canadian Space Mining Corporation. Good to have you with us, Daniel. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's a very exciting topic. So let's start off with getting an overview of just how big the space mining sector is at the moment. Yeah, hard to get an exact figure of how it is at the, at the moment. Uh, the space mining sector has been around for about 10 years. You had a first kind of generation of companies who came and went. They were maybe a little early in the space. Now there's a lot of activity and new startups in the space. The sector itself is forecast to be around uh, 100 billion plus but between now and kind of 2040. So over 100 billion by now in 2040. Yeah. Um, and when we say space mining, yeah. are we talking about mining asteroids? Are we talking about mining on the moon? What does that actually entail? I mean, I think it entails a lot of different things. It means different things to different people. But what, from a technical perspective, it's really called in situ resource utilization. So really using the resources in space to um, uh, sustain activities in space. That's how we think of it, at least. Um, and we're focused on the lunar environment. And the lunar environment is gaining a lot of interest, so much so that there's actually a legal framework to guide how it's going to be exploited. I don't like to use the word exploited because it has right. negative connotations, yeah. but the Artemis Accords are a framework that sort of governs this. Explain what that is. Yeah, so to almost take a, a step back, the Artemis Accords are, are a facet of the uh, Artemis missions. So in the Artemis program, so Artemis being sister of Apollo, there is a new return to the moon that is happening right now globally around the world with NASA, the European Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, JAXA, and others returning to the lunar environment. First mission starting uh, this year, first manned mission starting in 2025, and they want to have people living on the moon uh, in established lunar bases around 2030, give or take a couple of years. Uh, so along with that, uh, Canada and seven other countries signed the Artemis Accords in October of 2020, and that was a framework for the commercial use of extraterrestrial resources. They call it principles for extra use of extraterrestrial resources. That has been snowballing at an international level. Uh, we now have, I believe, 18 signatories. France agreed to sign it uh, last week. Um, and that's building kind of consensus at an international level. The main governing document of space has been the Outer Space Treaty, uh, but that never really envisioned commercial actors in space. Uh, it was really about nation states only, and we're really reaching this new kind of uh, uh, era of space where you have this divergence between commercial actors and governments in space. In terms of governments, where is China in this list of Artemis Accords participants? They are not participating in it. Um, that's kind of the big elephant in the room is what China is doing. And, and what, you know, what is the value of these accords if China does not participate, if Russia does not participate in, within them and, and play by the same set of rules as okay. everyone else. So, but China is currently uh, a member, I believe, of the Outer Space Treaty, as are all other uh, countries, and that is still the guiding document uh, of space. But let's go back to what you said yeah. about manned missions, people living on the moon yeah. by 2030. Yeah, in and around there, right? Uh, the dates you know, may slip a little as different technical delays happen and stuff like that, but that is the goal. China has, so NASA originally said they wanted to have uh, uh, manned bases around 2030. There's a new space station going up in lunar orbit called Gateway, which is fully funded and under construction. Canada is investing $2 billion into a new Canada arm, the Canada Arm 3, to go on that space station, and that will be operational around 2027. Um, NASA said they wanted to have manned moon bases around 2035, but now the Chinese have come out and said that they want to have manned moon bases with Russia that they're building around 2030. And so we think there's a real acceleration of things happening here as you have an increasing amount of competition, and uh, China is very aggressive in terms of the missions that is planning at a very high cadence. Okay, so this is where your company comes in because you're trying to help sustain these moon colonies by mining oxygen and hydrogen. Yeah, as, as, as we extend life beyond planet Earth, right, and move onto other planets, we need to learn to utilize the resources that are there on those bodies in order to sustain 
our presence on them. So what we're doing as a space mining company is to mine the lunar dust, uh, the, the regolith on the lunar surface in order to accept, effectively extract the oxygen and the hydrogen for it um, uh, to create a new supply chain in space. The base layer is really oxygen and hydrogen. So uh, those are primary components in rocket fuel, oxygen being seven eighths of rocket fuel um, and, and both of them being also important for sustaining life. So there's oxygen and hydrogen in moon dust. There's oxygen, hydrogen moon, in moon dust, more oxygen than hydrogen. There is also a lot of uh, water on the moon. So in the permanently shadowed craters of the North and South Pole, there are large amounts of water ice. Uh, we don't know exactly what state it's in, but it has been proven to be there. And that's what some of these early exploratory missions are. Have you had any proof of concept yet with your particular mission? Well, well I think this has been kind of proven out um, over the past couple of decades by uh, a variety of parties. We're not the first uh, lunar miner, nor are we the first to think about it. People have been thinking about this for 200 years. There's been universities that have been working on it for 40 years. One of my partners, Richard Boudreaux, has been working on this for about 40 years. Um, so talk me through the technology involved here and what your particular company, the Canadian Space Mining Corporation, offers. Yeah, so we're looking at building kind of a long-term world-leading space resources business. So I would say, you know, in the 10 plus year range, we are a operational mining business in space. Uh, think of us almost like the shell, so energy supply chain in space, plus Suez water supply chain in space, plus like ballet base metals supply chain in space. We're all that kind of in one company. In the near, in the, in the near term, we are a picks and shovels company because we are helping to build the tech stack in order to support that activity. So we're working on some of the stuff related to AI and prospecting sensors, new sensor technologies to discover uh, resources uh, in space, uh, stuff that's applicable to mining on Earth, which we plan on commercializing with mining partners, uh, stuff on uh, autonomous mining and construction equipment for the lunar environment, stuff that's applicable and disruptive to Earth's uh, industries, uh, stuff about remote energy generation and, and power supply in the lunar environment. Um, so various pieces of the tech stack, all of which are things we think solve big problems on Earth, can be commercialized on Earth in the near term, therefore help us make money in the, in the meantime as we make it to space. So commercialize things on Earth before you make it to space? At the same time, you know? Okay, um, but let's go back to space because that's clearly a little bit more interesting at the yeah. moment. So who would probably be the first to have a, a manned mission on the moon by 2030? Well, uh, so, so the uh, manned missions, the first one are 2025. They're government missions, right? So it's NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, uh, and others. We, I don't think we have a clear insight into when China's manned missions are. They're a little uh, a coy on that. Um, but th those will be the first missions. I believe there's a plan for a mission every single year uh, starting in 2025. But to build a colony yeah. infrastructure on the moon. Yeah. Uh, big civilization scale problems, which are going to require a lot of technology, a lot of know-how, and a lot of capabilities, which are now being developed by parties all over the world. Okay, so paint me a picture. It's 2050. Okay. How do you fit in and how do other companies in this mining of moon resources fit in in this picture with space colonies in 2050? Drop me there on the moon, 2050, what am I looking at? Yeah, I think there's gonna be lots of activity, uh, both commercial activity happening, government activity, where there's uh, uh, important science being done in the lunar environment, uh, figuring out how to extend the cradle of civilization beyond Earth. The moon is really a test bed for uh, Mars, right? Uh, Mars is very far away. The moon is not that far away. And so as we perfect the ability to live off other planets, ISRU, in situ resource utilization, it's really gonna be uh, uh, on the moon and then kind of extending that to Mars. So stuff like agriculture, stuff like remote energy generation, creating water and harvesting resources on other planets, doing important science work, experiments uh, and the like, as well as probably, you know, some hospitality, some other things, people will be going to the space, going to the moon for tourism. Uh, for short amounts of time. and Yeah, and you're gonna need some snacks if you're touring the moon, right? right? Yeah. So your company is basically going to service the manned colonies that you anticipate are going to be increasing 
quite dramatically from 2025 onwards. Yeah, we're creating the ability to move uh, material on the moon okay. um, and do stuff with it. So part of that is to harvest it into resources. Part of that is to construct uh, civil engineering infrastructure, build infrastructure. So we want to be one of the players who are creating infrastructure in the lunar environment creating consumables um, and helping enable a lot of this activity. How far along are you? Have you actually got any resources on the moon, on the way to the moon? We, we are not on the moon yet. We are hoping to get there in the next couple of years for our first mission. So where are you in the process right now with your particular company? Yeah, we are building out architecture, what are called concept of operations, um, and doing a lot of planning relating that. And then we're building some of the pieces of the technology with various partners, whether they be corporate, academic, et cetera, solving some of these uh, big problems uh, that everyone will need. We are aware of 130 commercial missions planned to the lunar environment between now and 2030, so in the next eight years. They're all gonna need pieces of technology and we're helping to solve some of those problems. 130 so, commercial missions, yeah, okay. That is the number I've seen, yeah. So what is your competition like? Is there any company that currently does do this on the moon? There is no one doing this on the moon yet. There are companies going to the moon in the next couple of years. Some of them will do pieces of it. We are unaware of a at a coordinated level of anyone quite like us uh, who are working and solely for focused on the ISRU component. There are companies that are involved in various facets of, of ISRU and anywhere from big major aerospace companies like Lockheed Martin who are working on on parts of it uh, to small startups and stuff like that. Okay, so currently it's a bit of a space race, if you will, yes. to see who gets to the moon and is able to Entirely. figure out this resourcing and servicing of, but, of resources. But there. we're all not in a race. We are, a lot of us are working together, right? So this is big problems that are gonna involve a lot of cooperation. Why is Canada taking a big role in this? Yeah, so I don't know that Canada had historically, when we when we found, uh, founded the company about two years ago, there wasn't kind of much happening at a national level. Uh, uh, certainly there was a lot happening in the academic community, but there was no company really like us. And so we wanted to lead Canada into the future of it. We think that this is Canada's right to win. If you look at our, our, our brand at a global level, we're really good at being the responsible re uh, leader in natural resources. We think we can export that brand, leveraging our ability to do large scale, complex remote infrastructure in very harsh environments, as well as our expertise in uh, space, space robotics, space communications, and a bunch of other areas. And you have been awarded your company, uh, the Canadian Space Mining Corporation has been awarded a contract with a Canadian space agency. So that's quite significant. Tell us about that. Yeah, we won a contract about two weeks ago with the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, it was a very competitive RFP process. We're the only startup to be awarded a contract in that process against uh, other very established players. We are the only one to be awarded a contract in space mining and ISRU. It is to carve out a vision, and we are carving out a very bold vision for the future of Canada's space program to lead it into the future in an area where we think it can be the long-term leader in. So as a startup, who's currently funding you? Yeah, we are funded by uh, a, a lot of different investors that uh, we raised a, a friends and family round uh, last year and then now have some uh, funding from the government as well as from some uh, other sources and we are uh, headed towards our kind of next raise uh, sometime later this year. Are there any companies that are further along in the financing process that are listed? If an investor wanted to gain exposure to the space, yeah. other than contacting you and saying, yeah. hey, Dave, can I fund your company? What, yeah. what, <laughs> uh, sorry, Dan, what, what is the best way for investors to get into this? Yeah, there are no publicly traded vehicles right now and public entry points into this. I mean, you could invest in you know, uh, a Lockheed or one of the big space companies, but you'll get very small exposure to this as a sector. Um, but that's where we believe we can play a role over the next couple of years is being uh, a gateway for capital into this opportunity. This is a big opportunity. Um, uh, and we think one day it will dwarf the terrestrial mining sector. It's a big statement. Yeah. And a little bit about your background because you moved into mining from cannabis, I believe. Technically real estate, but uh, yeah, I started a, a cannabis real estate investment company focused on sale lease backs in the cannabis sector. But my whole background's been in uh, real estate development, uh, finance, private equity uh, over my career um, in a bunch of various capacities in Canada, the US, Germany, um, and have uh, a variety of experience, which I think actually 
in a strange way le lends itself to this. Uh, real estate and real estate development in particular is often working on large complex projects with a lot of uh, different people with different skill sets and pulling them together under a vision, which is really what I think I do here. But I am a unqualified person to be running a space company. I'm lucky to have such smart, accomplished partners uh, who have deep, deep institutional experience within the space sector. So how did you get involved in the space then, in the space of space? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to joke, it's, uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was uh, bored and building puzzles, this is my puzzles. Um, I wanted a challenge. I had realized that the first 15 years of my career, I'd worked on four and a half billion dollars of real estate deals, and I'm not sure what it did for civilization. And I wanted something more challenging uh, and that I could move the needle for civilization in the process. And, and in this, I found that. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You want to be part of that? Yeah, entirely. So final question, what space movie inspired you most? Honestly, uh, I would say it's Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. Oh, yeah, it's a classic. I, it okay. is actually my, you know, my favorite movie. Um, it's hilarious. It's a genius movie from end to end, and I remember the day I watched it first. So I, I remember the scene when they're combing the desert, right. and they're literally taking a comb, yeah. a giant comb, across uh, the sands of the desert. Rick, Rick Moranis That's is in that right. movie. Yeah. yeah, I would not expect for you to have given me that answer. I know, uh, but it's all part of the expect the unexpected package here. With I you. also don't want to be burned alive for having picked Star Wars or Star Trek, which has happened before. I don't know. I was thinking you maybe go for more of an interstellar right. type of answer. Great film. Okay, well, it's a great discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Kitco News special coverage of the PDAC convention is brought to you by Gold Mining and Uranium Energy Corp.